Turn with me in your Bibles today to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Lord Jesus Christ says here in Matthew 7 verse 26, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. It came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Our Lord says here that those who know his will, but refuse to do it, will suffer the consequences of their folly either in this life or at the judgment seat of Christ, when great will be the fall and the collapse of their house. Jesus refers here to his sayings, these sayings of mine, which most certainly includes not only his commands and his ordinances for the church, but also includes every one of his teachings and doctrines that are recorded for us in the New Testament. Christ says here that those that know his word but refuse to heed it are foolish. The original word translated here as foolish is elsewhere simply translated as fool, such as when Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, Woe to you, ye blind guides. He said fools and blind. He called them fools and blind. That word translated foolish or fool or foolishness in some places in the Greek is the word moros, from which we get, of course, our English word moron. Uh, Strong's definition for that word reads as follows. Morose, dull or stupid as if shut up. That is heedless, morally. And then Strong uses the word blockhead. Blockhead, says Mr. Strong. I was very amused to find that word blockhead in Strong's definition. Um, But with that bit of insight from Mr. Strong, I think it very fair to say that the use of the word morose even as our Lord used it in reference to the spiritually blind Pharisees, uh, is comparable to our English usage of the term moron or idiot as used synonymously for the word fool in our vernacular English. Which words are commonly used in our society to describe a person who acts foolishly, ignoring the obvious consequences or folly of his actions. According to Wikipedia, a phrase used commonly in political jargon is the phrase useful idiot, defined as a person who acts as a propagandist and a proponent for a cause, the goals of which they are not fully aware of, and who is used cynically by the leaders of that cause. According to the Oxford Dictionary of Euphemisms, that phrase was used by Vladimir Lenin, who of course engineered the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia in 1917 used by Vladimir Lenin to refer to American Wall Street bankers and Soviet sympathizers in Western media uh, that he and his communist comrades had manipulated into financing and supporting the Bolshevik Revolution in there in Russia. William Bennett, who was Secretary of Education under Ronald Reagan, once recounted a famous story where Lenin referred to such useful idiots as he was asked, how will we hang the capitalists? We don't have enough rope. Lenin was reported to have famously replied, they will sell it to us on credit. So, not that I'm a fan of uh, Donald Trump, but that phrase, useful idiots, I believe would apply in our day, for instance, to the masses of mindless leftists and socialists who were allegedly paid by the DNC to violently protest Trump rallies during the presidential campaign, or to the ignorant naive folks who were allegedly paid to protest for the inherently racist propaganda group Black Lives Matter, or to the mindless and ignorant and blatantly racist white supremacists in Charlottesville, Virginia, that just last week followed a federal agent provocateur named Jason Kessler, or week before last. Jason Kessler, who organized and led the white supremacist protest there against the city's removal of the Robert E. Lee statue. By the way, until 2016, Mr. Kessler was an Obama supporter and a propagandist for Occupy Wall Street. So it appears that Kessler is indeed a federal agent provocateur. 
I do plan to come back to uh, in a couple of weeks to cover several political issues, including Trump's continuing and complete flip-flop from his campaign rhetoric and how I still believe, as we warned before the election and as we are seeing brought to pass, that Trump was allowed into or actually brought into power to solidify popular public support of the Pentagon's war agenda and also to foment the growing racial and uh, class tensions that we are seeing in this country, which is also part of the globalist war agenda to divide and to conquer. I think that's Trump's job. But for today's message and the very pertinent uh, subject of useful idiots, and this message I'm going to try to pull together many of the messages preached this year, in particular the messages on the dangers of the Hebrew Roots Judaizer movement, which is insepar inseparably linked to the earlier sermon series on the controversy of Zion, for which this message will actually be part seven in that series. I had hoped to conclude the series with this message, but just the subject is too big and there's too much more information, more ground needs to be covered, so this will not quite be the conclusion. But my purpose in this message is to show how the majority of so-called fundamental Baptists along with multi-millions of Pentecostals and mainstream evangelical Christians today, have been duped and deceived by the false doctrines of hyper-dispensationalism taught in the study notes of the Schofield Reference Bible, and to serving, I believe, as useful idiots of Antichrist Talmudic Judaism and its radically racist Zionist agenda along with this agenda to destroy biblical Christianity and the message of the cross. And therefore, the title of this message is Christian Hyper-Zionists, the Useful Idiots of Talmudic Judaism. As I'll elaborate um, later in this message, I'm trying to promote here, as C.H. Spurgeon also did a, half, a century and a half ago, a balanced Christian Zionism that recognizes God's prophetic plan to regather the Jews and to one day restore unbelieving Israel to fellowship with God, as Paul makes very clear in Romans chapter 11, but that rejects the abominable heresies of dispensationalism and the overt satanic evils of racist and antichrist Judaism, Talmudic Judaism. And therefore, for purposes of this message, I'm going to use the term hyper-Zionists to apply to the aforesaid majority of Baptists Pentecostals and evangelical Christians today who have fallen for this deception as promoted by Scofield and his cronies. Baptists in particular, many of whom foolishly think themselves to be the guardians of biblical truth, while most Baptists today have bought hook, line, and sinker into, and in fact love their Scofield reference Bibles, whose study notes have promulgated the lie that the Jews are God's chosen people today, whether they come to God through the cross of Christ or not. As defined, a useful idiot is a person who acts as a propagandist and a proponent for a cause, the goals of which he's not fully aware of, and who is used cynically by the leaders of that cause to achieve their purpose. Jesus said, Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and multiplied millions of gullible, naive, and willfully ignorant Christians who have Christ's word before them in black and white to correct them, but who foolishly prefer the lies of C.I. Schofield and John Walbert and Jack Van Wimpy and the rabid apostate John Hagee. And they have built their spiritual house on sinking sand. They've been duped and are being used by today's Pharisees of Talmudic Judaism, who actually financed the production of the Schofield Bibles, well, I'll mention later, and who are using them not only to pervert the true gospel and the doctrines of Christ, which is in, is in itself more than enough uh, to call such Christians to repentance, which is what I'm doing. They're also being employed as useful idiots to support, to finance, and to politically promote a most immoral an anti-Christian anti political policy of aggressive military imperialism and interventionism on Israel's behalf. As Donald Trump ensured this past week, 
of ongoing and perpetual military warfare against an enemy of their own making, along with the blind, blank check support of state-imposed repression and racist oppression by the modern state of Israel against the people that formerly lived in the now-occupied territories of the lands and the homes that Israel stole from them in its war of conquest in 1967, some of whom are and were Christian. I am not now and would never in a million years condone the satanic Islamic religion practiced by most of the people whose lands and homes were stolen by Israel in that six-day war. But I would point out to all who hear this message that the equally satanic religion of rabbinic or Talmudic Judaism, Amen. which is the dominant and controlling faction of Israel politics, is no better than the satanic religion of Islam. And in many ways, is far more sinister, menacing, and dangerous. And the reason that I say such hyper-Zionists are useful idiots for Talmudic Judaism is because the Schofield Bible was actually funded by the Jewish World Zionist Organization and the Rothschild family, and it was produced for the sole purpose of furthering the agenda of Christ-rejecting Talmudic Jews who believed that they were entitled to retake the Holy Land from the Palestinians that, hold, that held that land for centuries. This fact has been fairly well documented by a couple sources. For today, I want to briefly quote uh, from one source that, on this topic that says as follows. In his 2008 book, The Rise of Israel, A History of a Revolutionary State, Jonathan Edelman describes the crucial support Israel receives from Christian fundamentalists as Totally fortuitous. Or it's just it wasn't not expected. The incredible career of the man who wrote the Bible of Fundamentalism, Schofield, however, cast considerable doubt on that assertion. Two years after Schofield's reported conversion to Christianity in 1879, the Atchison Patriot, a newspaper, was less than impressed. Describing the former Atchison resident as the late lawyer, politician, and shyster generally, the article went on to recount a few of Schofield's many malicious acts. The article says these included a series of forgeries in St. Louis for which he was sentenced to six months in jail. By the way, his malicious acts also includes adultery, a divorce, and abandonment of his first wife uh, and their two children. She abandoned and then subsequently had a later remarriage. Uh, being a, a born-again preacher, however, did not preclude Schofield from becoming a member of an exclusive New York men's club in 1901. In his devastating biography, this article says, The Incredible Schofield and His Book, written by Joseph Canfield. Now, Canfield comments, The admission of Schofield to the Lotus Club, Rich Men's Club, uh, which could not have been sought by Schofield, he couldn't have gone after it, strengthens the suspicion that has cropped up before that someone was directing the career of C.I. Schofield. That someone, Canfield Documents, was associated with one of the club's committee members, the Wall Street lawyer Samuel Untermeyer, Jewish, as Canfield intimates, as Canfield intimates, Schofield's theology was most helpful in getting fundamentalist Christians to back the international interest in one of Untermeyer's pet projects, the Zionist movement, the World Zionist Organization. Others, however, have been more explicit about the nature of Schofield's service to the Zionist agenda. In Unjust War Theory, Christian Zionism and the Road to Jerusalem, Professor David Lutz claims, Untermeyer used Schofield, a Kansas City lawyer with no formal training in theology, to inject Zionist ideas into American Protestantism. Untermeyer and other wealthy and influential Zionists, that means the Rothschilds, whom he introduced to Schofield, promoted and funded the latter's career, including travel in Europe. And this article summarizes, absent such powerful connections, it's hard to imagine this peer among scalawags ever getting a contract with Oxford University Press to publish his Bible. Galatians chapter 1, please. Galatians chapter 1. We looked at this passage of Scripture in a message two weeks ago in our study on the Hebrew Roots Movement and the return of the Judaizers. Once again, the Apostle Paul says here in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but 
there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And then to reemphasize his point and to drive it home, Paul does something here that I don't think, I can't think of anywhere else in the New Testament that he does this. He actually repeats himself in the very next verse. Verse 9, As we said before, so see I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than ye have received, let him be accursed. Paul says here, I repeat, there's only one gospel. And if any man comes to you saying there's another gospel, let him be accursed. That Greek word is anathema, meaning excommunicated and cut off from Christ. Eternally damned, by the way, unless brought to repentance. Some time ago, I preached, presented a series of messages on the multiple heresies of the Schofield Reference Bible, which we also touched on last April 4th in part four of this series. And we're going to review a little bit uh, more in depth today. And I laid out specifically from the study notes in that, in that Schofield Bible how another useful idiot by the name of Cyrus Ingerson Schofield was used by his Zionist financiers to launch an all-out attack on Christian doctrine, on the gospel, on the ministry and message of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And as a matter of necessity to enable his other heresies, he launched also an attack on biblical eschatology as well. And discussing these issues a couple of years ago with a friend of mine, a pastor friend, by the way, over the phone, who was who had been schooled in the doctrines of C.I. Schofield and who had taught those doctrines to the Baptist church he had pastored for over 40 years. I pointed out to my friend that John Hagee's diabolical and satanic dual covenantalism, his doctrine that the Jews have a separate covenant with God through the Torah and that they therefore do not need to hear the gospel or believe on Christ to be saved, I told him that came right out of the Schofield Reference Bible. He objected and said, that's not true. And so I asked him, please, to get out his Schofield Bible and read Schofield's study note at Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. By the way, I do have copies of Schofield's notes in your bulletins there that you can follow along with, uh, excerpted from a PDF I'm going to post with this message online. So my friend got out his Schofield Bible, and he opened it to Revelation chapter 14, and he read that note, which says, Four forms of the gospel are to be distinguished. And then that note goes on to describe the four separate gospels of C.I. Schofield. After reading that note, my pastor friend said, I've taught for 40 years out of the Schofield Bible, and I never saw that note. Now, that's exactly what he said. I kid you not, as they say. I didn't push the issue at that time. I just said, well, there you go. Uh, but just to push the issue a little bit today, if I may, there are several damnable heresies presented just in that one abominable so-called study note in the Schofield Bible. And by the way, in dealing with Schofield's heresies today, I want to mention that while there is no universal, invisible, mystical church, as we elaborated on last week, I do use the term church in this message, as it does and will apply to the universal church of all believers in Christ from all ages that will one day be gloriously assembled together with Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb, which I see as the inauguration dinner for the millennium. Can't wait. Be a wonderful time. So then, here are Schofield's four separate Gospels as outlined in his note at Revelation 14, verse 6. Number one, the Gospel of the Kingdom. Schofield says this is the good news that God purposes to set up on the earth in fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, a kingdom, political, spiritual, Israelitish, that means Jewish, by the way, universal, that means over all the earth, over which God's son David's heir shall be king, and which shall be for 1,000 years the manifestation of the righteousness of God in human affairs. So Schofield says the gospel of the kingdom is the millennium uh, for the Jews, basically. And then Schofield says this. Two preachings of this gospel are mentioned. 
Well, that's only true in Schofield's note, because that's, that gospel is preached throughout the, the New Testament. But Schofield says two preachings of this gospel are mentioned. One past, beginning with the ministry of John the Baptist, continued by our Lord and his disciples, and ending with the Jewish rejection of the king, which is hogwash. That gets into how Schofield teaches that Jesus changed his message after he was rejected in about Matthew chapter 12. That's a whole separate heresy we won't get into today. He says the other is yet future, Matthew 24, 14, during the Great Tribulation, and immediately preceding the coming of the King in glory. That's Schofield's first gospel. So he says the gospel of the kingdom there is the millennium for the Jews. Second gospel, number two, the gospel of the grace of God. This is the good news that Jesus Christ, a rejected king, has died on the cross for the sins of the world, that he was raised from the dead for our justification, and that, by him, all the believers are justified from all things. Schofield's third gospel, the everlasting gospel, Revelation 14, verse 6, which is what this note is pinned to. All right? And Schofield says, This is to be preached to the earth dwellers at the very end of the great tribulation, and immediately preceding the judgment of the nations, is neither the gospel of the kingdom nor of grace, etc., etc. So, by the way, Schofield says the everlasting gospel was just preached for a very short time. And I don't know why on earth the everlasting gospel would be preached for just a short time. And we've gone into that in another message titled The Everlasting Gospel, and this is absolute absurdity. And then, Schofield's fourth gospel here is that which Paul calls my gospel. This is the gospel of the grace of God in its fullest development Etc., etc., etc. That's enough of this quote for now. So, Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. That's what Jesus said. That's what he said. That's where he defined the gospel of the kingdom. Schofield says in this blasphemous note that Paul and Christ preached different gospels. That Christ's gospel of the kingdom is an earthly is of an earthly kingdom intended just for Israel. Thank you, Luke. Israelitish, as Schofield says, or Jewish. We know from Schofield's notes elsewhere at Matthew 3, verse 2, and Matthew 6, verse 33, that he taught that there are two separate kingdoms. Two separate kingdoms. One, an earthly kingdom, kingdom for Israel, and the second, a heavenly kingdom for the church. That's what Schofield taught. He said that the kingdom of God is one of those, and the kingdom of heaven is the other. When, of course, those are synonymous terms. We've been all through that. But we also know uh, from Schofield's notes elsewhere that Schofield launched a blasphemous attack on the mission and the message of the Lord Jesus as being irrelevant to the church, saying his mission at his first advent was only to the Jews and national Israel, and that the gospel he preached was only that of an earthly kingdom for Israel. That's what Schofield taught. That's what he's teaching here. And this note. And while Schofield provides a nice little note at Matthew 28, verse 20, about the Trinity, he completely dodges the Lord's command and makes no comment on Christ's exhortation to his disciples uh, about Christ's great commission to his disciples or of his command to teach their converts to obey all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lo, I'm with you always. No comment on that fact. So... By the way, Christ's commands are relevant to the church. Amen. Contrary to what Schofield says. And by the way, Schofield always does this. He just avoids comment on passages that directly contradict and completely disprove his heresies. However, in Schofield's introduction to 2 Corinthians, he instead says this in attacking Christ's ministry. He says, It is evident that the really dangerous sect at Corinth was that which said, and I of Christ. Now that's the dangerous sect of Corinth. That's what Schofield says in his introduction to Second Corinthians. He says they rejected the new revelation through Paul, the doctrines of grace, grounding themselves probably, says Schofield, on the kingdom teachings of our Lord as a minister of circumcision. He says Jesus was a minister of circumcision to the Jews, seemingly oblivious that a new dispensation had been introduced by Christ's death. So prior to that time, basically Schofield says that Christ was a minister of the circumcision, a teacher of the law, and of works, gospel of works. In his introduction to the New Testament, Schofield says, the mission of Jesus was primarily to the Jews. 
The doctrines of grace are to be sought in the epistles, not the gospels. That's hogwash. That's heresy. Absolute, flat out heresy. And all the Baptists today love Schofield. They've not read his, his notes. In a study note at Matthew 5 2, Schofield says, The Sermon on the Mount and its primary application gives neither the privilege nor the duty of the church. These are found in the epistles. You can just ignore what Jesus says. Doesn't apply to the church. Just read the epistles of Paul. That's what Schofield says. Ignore what Jesus said. Jesus said, Teach him to obey all things whatsoever I've commanded you. So then, putting all this together, what Schofield is saying in his note here at Revelation 14, verse 6, is that Christ's gospel of the kingdom was a gospel of law, not grace. And is actually the good news through which the Jews can have an earthly kingdom separate from that of the church. That's what Schofield is saying here. Just like John Hagee's good news for the Jews. May I say that this is rank, abominable, blasphemous, sinister, and insidious heresy. And the Baptists all love Schofield. They're Schofield. They've got Schofield Bibles in their, in their pews, their churches. Pseudo-Baptists. Repeating quickly, stated before, previous messages, the gospel of grace was not introduced by Paul, as Schofield taught. Both the Lord Jesus and Paul, uh, as with the other apostles, by the way, preached that you must be born again, as the Lord Jesus made very clear to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Both the Lord Jesus and Paul and the apostles uh, preached that you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, that justification is by faith alone, as Christ also made clear to Nicodemus in John 3.16 and elsewhere, all through his teaching. Uh, both the Lord Jesus and Paul uh, with the other dis- apostles, preached that you must come to repentance from sin, by the way, to be saved, as Paul uh, told Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, that he had showed first unto them of Damascus and of Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Paul preached a gospel of repentance from sin, which sounds a bit like John the Baptist there in that passage. And by the way, both the Lord Jesus and the apostles preached the atoning and sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Jesus was not a minister of the law. Therefore, by the way, both the Lord Jesus and Paul, with the other apostles, preached this gospel of the kingdom. The same gospel that we are to preach as a witness to all nations. Just as Christ commanded his church in Matthew 24, not the Jews. When he said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness to all nations, he's talking to his church, his disciples, not to the Jews, as Schofield also says, and all the Schofieldites say. Paul said in Acts 20, uh, verse 25 to the Ephesian elders, And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Paul preached the gospel of the kingdom everywhere he went. So then, as stated, This abominable so-called study note planted by C.I. Schofield and his financiers at Revelation 14, verse 6 is a rank, abominable, blasphemous, sinister, and insidious heresy. And then Schofield dares, dares to close this most insidious note, Revelation 14, verse 6, with part 3. Look at part 3 in your notes there, stating as follows. There is another gospel. Galatians 1 verse 6 that we just read, that Paul repeated, which is not another, but a perversion of the gospel of the grace of God, which of course all this entire note has been, against which we are warned. He says it has many seductive forms, but the test is one. It invariably denies the sufficiency of grace alone to save, keep, and perfect, and mingles with grace some kind of human merit. Well, that sounds great, doesn't it? In Galatia it was law, in Colossae it's fanaticism. In any form, says Schofield, its teachers lie under the awful anathema of God. Well, guess what? C.I. Schofield fails his own test. According to his own lies here, Schofield's separate gospel number one, the gospel of the kingdom that Christ preached, denies the sufficiency of grace alone to save, to keep and perfect, and mingles with grace some kind of human merit, because his was the gospel of works. So, Mr. Schofield, by the way, the Lord Jesus said, by your own words you'll be 
a justified, and by your own words you'll be condemned. And I would say by Mr. Schofield's own words, from which, by the way, we have no record of him ever repenting or recanting. Mr. Schofield lies under the awful anathema of God. Excommunicated, I believe, and cut off from Christ, and by my estimate, eternally damned as one of the worst heretics of the past several centuries. All of this is why I say the pre-trib rapture, uh, the timing of the rapture in relation to the tribulation, is really a relatively minor issue. Very minor issue compared to these other damnable heresies. Except that the pre-trib rapture is the needed mechanism that enable these other heresies to be propagated. To remove the church from the earth to its home in the sky, right? So unbelieving Jews can have their kingdom here on this earth without ever having to come to Christ through the cross. Damnable heresies. So this is how, exactly how, John Hagee's blasphemous heresy comes right out of the Schofield Reference Bible. And this is also why I say all those who have followed C.I. Schofield and falling for and propagating this heresy have been asleep at the switch. They have been useful idiots in truth and effect for the devil himself. And that term is not too strong. Useful idiots are fools. So my pastor friend said he taught for 40 years out of the Schofield Bible and never seen that note. But unfortunately... Peter Ruckman and John Hagee and other heretics like them saw that note. And rather than recognizing Schofield's entire system for the satanic heresy that it is, as they should have immediately done, they instead expounded on it and built their eschatology on it and even their false gospel message on it. And uh, Ruckman, in fact, had all these various gospels that he taught about. John Hagee actually capitalized on it. He promoted his dual covenant, dual gospel heresy and became the poster boy for the Jewish Zionists. And then he became a multimillionaire. As a point of balance here, God the Father, I believe, says in Psalm chapter 2, verse 6, Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. The Bible is clear and repeats over and over that the Lord shall yet choose Jerusalem, Mount Zion, the city of the great king, as Jesus called it. And it is from Jerusalem that the Messiah, King Jesus, will one day reign in righteousness. So as mentioned earlier, I need to distinguish here between the balanced and the biblical Christian Zionism that we should promote and the heretical and the militant and warmongering hyper Zionism that results from the heretical doctrines of the Schofield Study Bible. And that as a result of that Bible's popularity, it is promoted or held to by probably 70 to 80 percent of apostate American pop Christianity today or more. And it certainly includes most so-called fundamental Baptists that we would know or would encounter. As covered In part three of this series, Return to Zion, I discovered recently that our view on this subject almost precisely matches that of uh, the Prince of Baptist preacher, C.H. Spurgeon, who a century and a half ago, after, by the way, John Nelson Darby had popularized dispensationalism in Britain, which then C.I. Schofield took from Darby and popularized in America, but to my delight, as we, as we talked about before, C.H. Spurgeon held to an almost identical, literal, historic, classical, post-trib eschatology as we do in rejecting the outlandish and extremely unbiblical doctrines of dispensationalism. One of the major tenets and demands of dispensationalism, of Schofield's and today's dispensationalism, as mentioned earlier, is this distinct separation between Israel and the church into two separate peoples of God with two separate destinies and kingdoms. Schofield wrote that the Jew was promised an earthly inheritance, earthly wealth, earthly honor, earthly power. The church has promised no such thing, says Schofield, but has pointed always to heaven as a place where she is to receive her rest and reward. So the church is going to go on to heaven and the Jews get the earth. That's basically what he taught. That's right. Schofield's note at Hosea chapter 2 verse 2 says this. That Israel 
is the wife of Jehovah, now disowned but yet to be restored, is the clear teaching of the passages. This relationship is not to be confounded with that of the church of Christ. And the mystery of the divine triunity, both are true, says Schofield. Sounds theological. The New Testament speaks of the church as a virgin espoused to one husband, which could never be said of an adulterous wife, in reference to Israel, restored in grace. Schofield concludes, Israel then is to be the restored and forgiven wife of Jehovah, the church, the virgin wife of the Lamb. By the way, as we've made very clear, the Lamb is Jehovah. All right, so two separate entities here. Israel is the restored and forgiven wife of Jehovah, the church, the virgin wife of the Lamb. Israel, Jehovah's earthly wife, and the church, the Lamb's heavenly bride. This separation and identification of Israel with a separate earthly kingdom from that of the church's alleged heavenly kingdom was required and it was concocted to promote Christian support for the Jewish brand of Zionism that was espoused by Theodore Herzl and the World Zionist Organization. It is, in fact, this separation of Israel and the church combined with Schofield's multi-gospel heresy found back in Revelation 14, verse 6, that results directly in John Hagee's dual covenant heresy. That he says the Jews have a separate covenant with God now, through the law don't need to be evangelized or to believe on Christ to be saved. And it is this concoction of an alleged separation of Israel and the church that require the additional fabrication and concoction of this momentous eschatological event taught nowhere in Scripture, known as a pre trib rapture of the church. Nowhere in the Bible, but they have to concoct this momentous event to enable the separation of the church so the church can be taken out and God can go back to dealing with Israel. As we do also, because the New Testament clearly teaches otherwise, C.H. Spurgeon saw this notion of strict separation between Israel and the church as heretical, stating as follows. I love this quote. Distinctions have been drawn by certain exceedingly wise men, parenthesis, measured by their own estimate of themselves, between the people of God who lived before the coming of Christ and those who lived afterwards. We never, he says, we never know what we shall hear next, and perhaps it is a, a mercy that these absurdities are revealed one at a time in order that we may be able to endure their stupidity without dying of amazement. I love Spurgeon's style there. So he didn't call these folks idiots, but he did note their stupidity, which in my view is the same thing. Continuing with the quote, Spurgeon said, Why, every child of God in every place stands on the same footing. The Lord has not some children best beloved, some second-rate offspring, and others whom he hardly cares about. Now, those who saw Christ the day before it came had a great difference as to what they knew. In other words, they didn't have as much revelation. And perhaps in the same measure, a difference as to what they enjoyed while on earth, meditating upon Christ. But they were all washed in the same blood, all redeemed with the same ransom price and made members of the same body. Old Testament saints made members of the same body, he says, as a church. He says, Israel in the covenant of grace is not natural Israel, but all believers in all ages. Before the first advent, all the types and shadows all pointed one way. They pointed to Christ. To him, all the saints looked with hope. Those who lived before Christ were not saved with a different salvation of that which shall come to us. They exercised faith as we must. That faith struggled as our struggles. And that faith obtained its reward as our shall. In another instance, Spurgeon stated, Surely, beloved brethren, you ought not to stumble at the anachronism, meaning the maintaining of an ancient doctrine, of comprising Abraham, David, and others in the fellowship of the church. It's also clear from Spurgeon's Treasury of David in his writings there, that he viewed the church as a recipient of the kingdom promises of God. However, while rejecting as utter stupidity the dispensationalist separation of Israel and the church into two separate peoples of God, Spurgeon also rejected the preterist notion that God has no future prophetic plan for Jerusalem, for the Jews, and for national Israel. And he acknowledged that there must be uh, a regathering of the Jews to that land, stating as follows. Spurgeon said, we shall at once profess our attachment to the premillennial school interpretation and the literal reading of those scriptures 
that predict the return of Jews to their own land. So Spurgeon said, as for the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ, Revelation chapter 20, Spurgeon said this, some think that this descent of the Lord will be post-millennial, that is, after the thousand years of the reign. He said, I cannot think so. I can see that the advent will be premillennial, that he will come first, and then he will, and then will come the millennium as a result of his personal reign upon earth. He says, some more of his, uh, humor. He said, there are some sanguine brethren who are looking forward to everything growing better and better and better until at the last this present age ripens into a millennium. They will not be able to sustain their hopes, says Spurgeon. For Scripture gives them no solid basis to rest upon. We who believe that there will be no millennial reign without the king and who expect no rule of righteousness except from the appearing of the righteous Lord are nearer the mark, said Spurgeon. Good stuff there. As for the restoration of national Israel, on June 16th, uh, 1864, uh, Spurgeon preached on the restoration and, and conversion of the Jews. And he stated this, there will be a native government again. There will again be the form of a body politic. A state shall be incorporated and a king shall reign. Israel has now become alienated from her own land. Her sons, though they can never forget the sacred dust of Palestine, yet die at a hopeless distance from her consecrated shores. But it shall not be so forever, said Spurgeon, for her sons shall again rejoice in her. Her land shall be called Beulah. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall her sons marry her. I will place you in your land, is God's promise to them, says Spurgeon. So then, because Paul most clearly in Romans chapter 10 to 11 says that God is not done with national Israel, we do advocate, as did Spurgeon, a balanced version of Christian Zionism, which is right and necessary, a biblical Zionism while utterly rejecting the abominable and overtly heretical doctrines of Schofieldite dispensationalism. And so, I plan to henceforth use the term hyper-Zionists to apply to the vast majority of Christians today who foolishly reject the clear teachings of Christ and instead prefer to believe the following lies promoted by the Schofield Bible and by modern heretics like John Hagee and others which like the occultic and idolatrous hexagram, uh, a.k.a. the star Rempan on Israel's flag, I have formulated into a six-point hyper-Zionist creed or manifesto. Six-point hyper-Zionist manifesto. Point number one of the hyper-Zionist manifesto is that the Jews retain chosen people status and a separate covenant with God whether they believe on Christ or not. That's what the hyper-Zionists believe. And thus there are two separate groups of elect chosen people of God, the church and Israel. That's what they believe. This, of course, is the essence of Hagee's dual covenant theory and is absolutely flatly rejected by the teachings of the New Testament. By the way, we do not preach replacement theology. Now, Paul is clear in Romans 11 that God is not through with national Israel, uh, but I also do not preach divided kingdom or divided chosen people theology. And neither did Paul. It is, in fact, the pre-tribbers that preach replacement theology and demanding that the church be removed from the earth to be replaced by Israel as the people of God on earth during the millennium. They are the ones preaching replacement theology. What does John say in Revelation chapter 5, by the way? He says, we shall reign on the earth. Revelation chapter 20 says, we shall reign with Christ for a thousand years, not the Jews only. This is not replacement theology. This is exactly what the Old Testament foretold and what Paul preached. Not replacement theology, but I call it expansion theology, as I mentioned before. But under the new covenant, God expands his kingdom, his covenant people, far beyond the mere fleshly descendants of Abraham. To include not only Jew, but Gentile as well. As even the Old Testament prophets declared in multiple passages. For instance, in Isaiah Chapter 49, verse 5. But now, and now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. That's Jesus talking, by the way. 
And he said, it is a light thing, he the father said, it is a light thing that thou should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou may be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. As we've said before, we now declare again, several New Testament passages make it very clear that there is to be but one chosen people of God, not two, beginning with the words of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 10, where he said, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known of mine. He said, as the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Then he says, and other sheep I have, talking about the Gentiles, which are not of this fold, them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice. And then he says, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. One fold and one shepherd. That's enough for me right there. Not two brides for two different husbands. It's interesting that Schofield says church theology is to be determined by the epistles of Paul. But his theology, Schofield's, and his teaching is directly contradictory to several passages where the Apostle Paul makes it clear that there is only to be one chosen people of God. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Follow along with me. Ephesians chapter 2. I'll wait till you get there. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that means by the Jews, that at that time, time past, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. That's where the Gentiles were. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Verse 14, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, one new man. One new man. So making peace. That he might reconcile both to God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them which were nigh, meaning the commonwealth of Israel. For through him we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Verse 19, Paul says, Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. You know, I wonder if C.I. Schofield may have forgotten to read this passage. I don't know. Uh, perhaps he read it, but for some reason chose not to comment on it, because as he often does, he completely dodges, avoids Multiple passages like this that disprove his false doctrines. Look over to chapter 3. Chapter 3 of Ephesians. Paul writes here in verse 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given uh, me to you, or how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. It's done in verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of man, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles. By the way, all the apostles, not just Paul. Paul didn't, was not the only one who got this revelation, as Schofield says in his note there, Revelation 14.6. Not just Paul. It was holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Fellow heirs. That means of the same inheritance, by the way. We have the same inheritance, same body, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. That's the mystery he's talking about here. Which from the beginning of the world have been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
What was that eternal purpose that God purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord? Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. That's the purpose. That's the eternal purpose. Not that there should be two separate peoples of God, one in heaven and one on earth. Not one body with a heavenly destiny and another body with an earthly kingdom. That Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise by the gospel. Paul says about the same thing in Galatians chapter 3. Where he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And he says, verse 29, and if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Paul says in multiple passages in very plain language that God takes what used to be two divided peoples and combines them into one new man. One new man. That union into one man includes the Gentiles and what Paul calls in Ephesians 2, the commonwealth of Israel. The commonwealth of Israel. Now united into one body, not two. Therefore, I want to repeat, as I've said many, many times before, no unbelieving Jew has any right calling himself one of God's chosen people today. Can't be done. Christians who love the Jews must therefore reach out to them with the gospel of Christ that they might be saved, contrary to John Hagee's false gospel of damnation to the Jews. John Hagee actually, in preaching this false gospel, is the most anti-Semite, uh, most famous anti-Semite of all in trying to deny them the gospel and condemn them all to hell. Point number two of the hyper-Zionist manifesto. Another lie of the devil. Today's Jews have, here and now, a rightful claim to all the land that God swore to Abraham, from the Mediterranean Sea to the Euphrates River. This position, as we talked about last time, is completely unbiblical, as explained in part six of the series. Obviously, the land was once theirs as a gift from God, but they squandered their inheritance. Now, just as God warned them repeatedly throughout the Old Testament, he drove them off of that land. The Lord Jesus warned his disciples in Luke chapter 21, and they, Israel, shall fall by the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem, Jerusalem shall be trodden of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. I submit that the times of the Gentiles are not yet fulfilled, though we may be close to that time. Jesus also said to the Christ-rejecting nation of Israel in Matthew 23, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. In other words, when they shall welcome the Lord Jesus as their true Messiah. Today, Israeli Jews have not even come near to the place where they will receive the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. And until they come to that place, which I do not believe will happen until the end of the tribulation when Christ returns in power and glory, until that time, we can presume that their house is left unto them desolate. And they have no claim to all that land. That's right. And all, we can also presume that Jerusalem will be trodden to the Gentiles until that wonderful day comes when Jesus does return in power and glory. Amen. I made it very clear in the first four parts of this series that God is not through with Israel as a nation or with the Jews as a people, that the Jews must be regarded to that land, must promise to Abraham, and also that they must be gathered in a state of unbelief before the 70th week of Daniel can begin to set the stage for the return of Christ. However, there is not one verse in the Bible that shows that the Jews will be restored to all the land before the end of the tribulation and the beginning of the millennium. And as I've also stated, I have no problem biblically with concluding that the, until the Lord, by his divine intervention, gives them all the land that he once swore to Abraham, Israel can expect to have to share the land with those that God allowed to have the land in their absence after he drove them from that land. Point number three of the Hyper-Zionist Manifesto. As a result of their rightful claim to the land, Israel today has a right, just as they did in the days of Joshua, to wage wars of aggression, to drive out the Canaanites, now known as the Palestinians, to occupy and take over their land and their homes. That's basically what these people believe. No one I know will actually come out and say this is uh, their position. 
But the fact is that this is their position. This is the end result of their position. And it is completely ludicrous and contrary to what I just stated as to when Israel will be restored. Talked about that quite a bit. Point number four of the hyper Zionist manifesto is that there is no such people group as the Palestinians. Dealt with that last time also. Mentioned, talked about the people who live in the occupied territories whose lands and homes were taken in the 1967 uh, Six Day War. They say that uh, they were all Jordanians and Syrians who, you know, moved, they migrated to Israel looking for work after Israel began developing their industries. That's a flat out lie. Yeah. We've talked about that. In part six of this series, we completely uh, debunked and disproved this assertion, looking at the history of the region, of course, going back to the seventh century, and uh, also at the, the uh, demographic records from the late 1800s and 1900 before the Jews began immigrating in mass into that region. And I would urge anyone who's not heard that message to go back and listen to it. Point number five of the hyper-Zionist manifesto is that those who claim to be Palestinians should move to Jordan or to some other location. And if they refuse uh, to move, then they must actually surrender their civil liberties or convert to Judaism. Again, most hyper-Zionists will not say this is their position. But that's simply because uh, a useful idiot is a person who acts as a propagandist and a proponent for a cause, the goals of which he's not fully aware of, and who is cynically used by leaders of that cause. They would say that's not what they believe, but that is actually the uh, the goal of the Talmudic State of Israel. That, that is the policy that they are supporting there. Either convert to Judaism, or you're going to get expelled. Or you're going to lose your civil liberties. You can't vote. You have to be stuck in this, basically, uh, prison. Surrounded by these walls. I'm going to come back to that next time. I, I really need to talk about the current situation in Israel, which I don't have time to do today. I will come back to that next time, though. Point number six of the Hyper-Zionist Manifesto is that America should continue sending is Israel billions of dollars annually in foreign aid and should maintain its own wars of aggression against Israel's neighbors and enemies. And that's what Trump is now doing. I'm going to come back to these last two points in the concluding message of this series, Lord willing, next week. We really do need to take a hard look at the current situation in Israel and how the Palestinians have been absolutely oppressed by Israel policies as have been bolstered and supported by American policies, and in particular by the support of millions of the herein described hyper-Zionists. It's getting like I'm out of time for today's message. Next week, in addition to uh, the current situation in Israel, I want to look somewhat in depth at the gross evils of Talmudic Judaism itself, which used C.I. Schofield to publish this Bible, which has deceived millions of duped hyper-Zionists into supporting these evil policies of Israel and of the American government as well. The purpose of this message today is to hopefully wake up some of our hyper-Zionist friends to the absolute heresy of their position biblically, theologically. We have some friends who have bought hook, line, and sinker into this, and I would call them to repent. Amen. They need to repent of this heresy. Now they're Basically, they're sacrificing Christian morals and Christian doctrine and the gospel, and the ministry and message of the Lord Jesus Christ himself on the altar of Talmudic Judaism. I do hope I've gotten through to someone in that regard with this message. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we do thank you for your word. Thank you so much that you have opened our eyes to these truths. We pray for our Christian brethren, many of our Baptist brethren, who have been completely deluded and deceived by this gross deception, by these abominable heresies in the Schofield Reference Bible. Lord, I pray for their repentance. I pray that you'd wake them up. I could name many of our friends, Lord. I won't do that, but I just pray that you'd wake them up and bring them to repentance from this gross heresy. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.